this edition of Sightings, Tim White and an investigative team encounter a frightening entity. I can tell that uh, you're losing your breath right now. Oh, man. That's weird. These women share a terrifying memory of alien abduction. Do angels exist? These children believe they were saved by spirits from beyond. Absolutely no way that we could have made without some kind of help. And in Colorado, a deadly mystery continues. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Recently, we brought you the story of a Midwestern family that's been plagued by bizarre haunting activity. Well, from our initial investigation, the videotape that our sightings crew brought back was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. We brought in renowned ghost investigator Al Rober to join our team, and along with the crew, Al and I went to meet the family. The family wishes to remain anonymous. We're using pseudonyms here and concealing the father's identity. How are the, um, the scratches that you had that we saw before, are they healing? Well, this is sent here scarred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the uh, ones on my stomach are healing that pretty good. Just two weeks before, these bleeding welts materialized on camera during our first sightings investigation. The tape of that event was analyzed by Carrie Gaynor, world-renowned parapsychologist who was lead investigator on both the entity and poltergeist cases. He asked to view the images of this bizarre yeah, event side by side. On the right, a frame of video with a long bleeding welt. Yeah, the on the left, an image taken eight minutes earlier when our camera first began to roll. There's no welt visible. The exciting thing for me as a researcher is that the camera didn't pull away. It was there the whole time, and that severely reduces the, the possibility of any kind of hoax. Most of the cases we come across are playful, mischievous, bizarre, weird, and a lot of them have just normal natural explanations. This case that involves scratch marks, this seems a little more frightening and something that we should be a little more cautious about in terms of, of studying the phenomena. The phenomena in this house, according to the family who lives here, are caused by Sally, the spirit of a seven-year-old child. They believe it's Sally who causes paranormal activity, like lights flickering on and off mysteriously, as seen in this home video. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, on the left side, right. Family photos have turned up with unusual blurring and discoloration, confounding our photo experts. During our initial investigation, Paranormal researcher Howard Heim felt and recorded strange sensations of cold and electromagnetism. I actually feel like a small uh, circumference about uh, four inches in diameter coming straight down. Sightings camera operator Phil Lapkin was startled when an intense charge of static electricity began swirling around him. Our audio equipment was able to record a snapping sound along the floor and around his legs. On our return to the house, we asked ghost investigator Al Rober to gather additional hard data at the site. His equipment can monitor electromagnetic energy and minute temperature fluctuations. He photographed and examined items that were supposedly touched and in some cases burned by the entity. There's a chemical that's built on this. Tim? Yeah. I would assume from that, Greg, that you are feeling well, that something. Air conditioner's off. I feel it blowing right through here. Do you? Well, a little bit. I'm going to move over here and see if I can feel the same thing, though. Yeah, now we're in front of a window and an air conditioner right. that's off. Right. All right, I, can, I, I definitely can feel a sense of, uh, of some air moving there. Yeah. Let, let, let's sit back down and talk. And Tony, As we continued videotaping, I was not the only member of the sightings crew who seemed to feel a strange sensation of cold air circulating in small, isolated patches. It happened again and again. Oh, man. That's weird. 
It's right, yeah, right here. Ooh, and boy. the hair on your arms uh, is standing up. Right here. I can see a, see the hair yeah. over in this area here. Ooh, just right, right here. In and of itself, the sensation of cold and static electricity was intriguing, but not proof of the existence of Sally. However, the sensations, some were feeling more strongly than others, were usually followed by physical harm to Jeff. More. Oh. Well, now that's very interesting. Why don't you sit down? Why don't you sit, why don't you sit down? I can t I can tell that uh, you're. You're losing your breath right now. <laughs> Sally, what did I tell you? Sally, we see you. Uh, we know you're here. Whoever or whatever was responsible for these painful scratches struck repeatedly throughout the day. At one point, new welts began to form on Jeff's stomach. Then, I was shocked to see mysterious welts forming on his forehead. This whole spirit thing scares me, and it just, some of the things she's done, she's lit fires, and I, you know, I think, well, if she wants to hurt me, why couldn't she just light me on fire, or whatever she does to some of the other things around here, but yeah, this is as far as she goes. Al, are you saying that virtually everything that you've seen here today could be explained through psychokinesis or some sort of projection? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying understanding his feelings here and his intense fear he's very he's very frightened and uncomfortable being thrust into this environment that's not to say that there isn't uh, a little girl ghost walking around because in cases when you do have a poltergeist they seem to draw off the same energies what would your advice be to the couple living here um, one of the things I would I would tell them would be to try to document some more of this uh, another thing that I would do I would certainly recommend them to get rid of the toys in the corner and get rid of any encouragement that that is now going on for this little girl ghost whether the source of this bizarre activity lies within jeff or in an outside entity who craves attention the result is still unexplainable what type of energy could create the frightening diverse phenomena occurring here being on site observing the ghostly activity as it happens has been a disturbing experience it's clear that this case merits continued investigation and whatever comes of it, uh, we will try and pursue it as openly and honestly as we can here on sightings, and we will share it with you. We'll be back with more sightings in a moment. Next, two women share a terrifying memory of abduction by extraterrestrials. First memory I had was screaming because I had alien eyes right in front of my face. You meet a stranger and something about them is familiar. You know each other from somewhere, you just can't figure out where. When that happened to two women in Virginia, they racked their brains for more than a year and finally came up with an unsettling answer. They believe that, as children, they shared an alien abduction experience. At first, they were fragments of memory. As a child, Claire Holcomb had pastoral visions. Sometimes they were strange, sometimes they were disturbing, and later on they became terrifying. She never knew what it meant until she was an adult. In 1987, Claire was looking for a career change. She responded to an ad for full-time help on a horse farm. Her interview with ranch owner Diana Graves was a turning point. It was sort of, I know this person and she was very comfortable around the horses. And it was sort of an instant recognition, and I hired her that day. I felt when I first met Diana that I must have met her somewhere before or seen her somewhere before. I felt that I knew her quite well, but I couldn't explain that. Claire worked at the ranch for four years before she and Diana figured out their connection. It started on a dark country road. On my way home, fairly early in the evening, uh, it was a warm night for December. I see, saw lights in the sky that I thought were uh, low-flying aircraft, but I wasn't hearing any sounds, engine noises, and was concerned that perhaps the engines had shut down. I pulled over to the side of the road and was blinded by these lights, but I, I was frozen to the spot. I didn't know what was happening. Right after her sighting, Claire raced home, feeling sick, scared, and disoriented. 
I think both of us thought she was going crazy. Um, too much stress that, you know, maybe she'd had a blackout. Um, we couldn't explain the missing time. We didn't know what it was at the time. The first thing that I noticed from that first experience was that my contact lenses um, appeared to be missing from my eyes. And I certainly had them in when I was driving. Diana encouraged Claire to try and put the bizarre events behind her. But days later, Claire had another bizarre encounter. She was reporting to me that she seemed to have seen some strange things. She had memories of this weird hand that she drew. Sorry. And for some reason, I knew we needed help. I knew I could no longer handle it. They got that help through the Fund for UFO Research, an organization that investigates extraterrestrial events and tries to separate fact from fantasy. They felt Claire was exhibiting signs of a classic abduction. And many of the things she said, while not completely unique, were uh, disturbing things that I had read about before, and I had no reason to think that she was making the thing up or that it was being fab you know, fabricated in any way. It was startling to us that anybody could possibly have experienced these things and we've never heard about it. The abduction syndrome is essentially this pattern that you do get from collecting data from a large number of people and it, and it has all of these common features. The, the fundamental one being missing time. Then there are others, the, the markings, the, the very strange medical problems that they often develop. Along with Claire's health problems, Diana noticed that her employee was also seeing some health benefits. Claire's eyesight dramatically improved after her first abduction. Strangely, Diana's health started following the same course. My eyes had improved dramatically, and I could think of no other rational explanation why my, my eyesight was also improving, unless I too was being abducted. Diana wanted to know more and chose hypnotherapy as a way to retrieve her abduction mm -hmm. memories. Her first session was traumatic. And sure enough, the first memory I had was screaming because oh. I had alien eyes right in front of my face and I couldn't get away from them. What are they doing to you? What are they doing oh. to you? Doing something to my head. You're okay. The way the events occur, I'm very convinced that she has experienced something and I'm and what seems to be happening seems to be really truly happening to her she has she has the marks on her body under hypnosis Claire was also recalling vivid memories of torture experimentation and forced reproduction uh, we'd had some severe ice storms uh, it had been bitter cold uh, as is often the case I was abducted uh, from my, from my bedroom I had a nightgown on with no shoes, naturally, I didn't sleep in my shoes. And when I was brought back, they made a mistake, which they sometimes do. And instead of putting me back in the house, they left me outside. When I thought I was gonna die, the aliens came back, picked me up, and put me back in the house, in my bedroom. But the next morning, all the, the skin on the bottom of my feet uh, had been burned off from sticking to the ice. My conscious memory abductions are very fragmentary. I'll have a little bit of a memory of actually seeing a gray standing beside my bed at night um, or being poked in the back. Um, I'll have a memory of seeing either a blue or an orange light fill my room. The women could not escape the relentless fear that accompanied their abduction experiences. They sought help from world-renowned abduction expert Bud Hopkins. They were extremely impressive, uh, articulate, uh, obviously filled with a lot of emotion about their experiences. There was a lot of anger, a lot of fear. And uh, I, I was just extremely impressed with them. While discussing and comparing their separate abduction memories, Claire and Diana made a dramatic discovery. We were both uh, in a large room and scenes were being projected, very disturbing. Uh, scenes of devastation. Uh, we were told to watch it and to learn from it and to understand that these things were happening. We, we were, in fact, holding each other's hand. Well, the issue of shared abductions is something we should sort out here. Many, many, many people are abducted with other abductees. The women probed deeper into their past. Claire recalled a childhood abduction memory that she had shared with a little girl visiting from England. 
when I was about 12 years old and had been on a picnic with some friends uh, from school. I moved off by myself to sit on a bench uh, for some reason. I saw a little girl coming toward me that I didn't at the time recognize, and she was wearing a blue uniform. She had some kind of an accent that I thought might be British. Without it stopping to think or discuss uh, why we were doing this, we both meandered away from the picnic area uh, into the woods and uh, were subsequently abducted from that clearing together. The girl she was describing sounded like me when I was about the same age. And when Claire described to me what this other little English girl was wearing, I then went to the closet and pulled out a jacket that exactly matched her description. She described to me how she used to dress going to school in England at that time, and I didn't know she'd attended school in England when she was nine years old. I was that other child. We found a pattern that they had been abducted since childhood, separately, brought together, and made to interact as if the aliens were interested in human relationships and human friendships. I'm completely convinced that they have planned Claire and my meeting um, since they started, since we were such small children. I think it's amazing that we met again in this, in this life, in this world. Uh, although I can't explain it. Her coming to this farm five years ago was a coincidence. They arranged it, they planned it. I don't know why they planned it. I'm glad we met but they planned it. The issue of alien abduction has come under fire lately from mental health professionals who believe abductees are being manipulated through directed therapy and hypnosis. But the number of people who claim an abduction experience is growing, and they're not all going to the same therapists. National statistics indicate that as many as two million Americans may have had experiences consistent with an alien abduction. Coming up next, documenting a rare encounter with UFOs. And later, angels rescue children from the clutches of a madman. The most recent Roper poll suggests that a staggering 96% of all Americans have heard or read about the existence of UFOs. And as our awareness grows, so do reported sightings. Many viewers have written to ask what they should do in the event of a UFO sighting. For the answer, we went right to the experts. The number of UFO sightings has grown dramatically in the past 50 years, and so has the number of people actively searching the skies. Every night, thousands of people turn their attention to the heavens, hoping for a glimpse of what might be a UFO. Unfortunately, most of these sightings are just wishful thinking. We can explain and have explained, not explaining away, but explain a good 70, 75 percent, maybe even 80 percent. Bill Pitts heads a consortium of former military personnel who evaluate UFO sightings. The group, the new Project Blue Book, takes its name from the famed government UFO study, but there the similarity ends. Now, the purpose of Project Blue Book is to reevaluate the classic cases which we've been doing and also to even look at new cases as they come along that really come to our attention and we get excited over, and we have had several of those. Would you know what to do if you saw a UFO? The new Project Blue Book offers these guidelines for documenting your sighting. Watch closely the object you're observing and try to remember as much as you can about that object. Check to see if there are any noises that seem to be emanating from the particular object. Write it down as soon as you can, uh, and remembering uh, what it looked like to you initially, any changes made uh, during the observation. See also if it seems to be uh, going along in a straight trajectory, if it's zigzagging or any type of a motion up or down, sideways or otherwise, try to pinpoint the time as closely as possible that you're, while you're observing the object or light source. If you have a camera or camcorder available, take as many shots as possible and footage as possible of the object. Being careful with a camcorder or camera, if it's a motion picture camera especially, don't pan the object so fast that you're losing the object. You should notify your local police department or your sheriff's department, or if uh, they don't have any record of somebody else making a sighting report to them, 
then check with your FAA control tower operators for someone, someone else to turn it into or send it to us at Project Blue Book. Why is the new Project Blue Book so interested in evaluating new sightings? I think it would be a wonderful thing to find something extraterrestrial uh, visiting our shores and meeting with us. I don't know it'll ever happen in our lifetime, if ever, for that matter. Maybe we, maybe we have to go there to meet them on their grounds. And here's one more tip from the new Project Blue Book. If you sight what you believe to be a UFO and you have a video camera at the ready, remember that most camcorders have a built-in microphone. So while you're videotaping, record a running description of events as you see them. After the event, interview any other witnesses and, if possible, get their full names and addresses. When sightings continues, schoolmates are rescued from the brink of death by otherworldly forces. She had been sent to help me. She was my guardian angel. Then, a bizarre mystery continues, and later, new evidence that mythological creatures are real. It was a parent's worst nightmare. In 1987, a madman in Cokeville, Wyoming, took children hostage, then detonated a bomb in an elementary school classroom. Miraculously, none of the children died. Since then, books and movies have recounted the amazing story of the Cokeville bomb and speculated about why the children were spared. But now, for the first time, the children themselves speak out about how they believe they were saved. Their stories have a common thread, the presence of angels. Cokeville, Wyoming, population 493. They say it's like no place on earth. And that was never more true than on the day local children believe angels came to school. It started here around 11 a.m. when David and Doris Young, armed with guns and a bomb, took the entire school hostage. I said to them, is there something I could do to help you, sir? And he said, yes, ma'am, there certainly is. This is a revolution. Your school's being taken hostage. Consider yourself a hostage. If you'd looked in David Young's eyes, you knew it was no joke. I've never, ever looked in anyone's eyes that were so cold and so emotionless. I mean, there was like this big void. There was nothing there. David Young was a walking arsenal. In addition to automatic rifles, his body was wired to a bomb that could be detonated with a wave of his hand. He said the bomb was capable of blowing up the entire building. He said it will level this whole building and everyone in it. The hardest part of the whole thing was that I started out in this thing alone and I couldn't warn anyone. With a gun to her back, Mrs. Cook was forced to lead David and Doris Young to the school's first grade classroom. David Young made this his command center and forced all 153 teachers and students of the Cokeville Elementary School into the small room. He then demanded a $2 million ransom for each hostage. He said, this is a revolution. I'm holding you hostage. And um, one of the girls in my class just went hysterical. Young gave each teacher a copy of a bizarre manifesto outlining his apocalyptic plan for the children of Cokeville. He said, God equals infinity, infinity equals zero, therefore God does not exist. David Young was insane, incoherent, and unreasonable. He was a human bomb with a hair trigger. The ultimate plan was he was going to, after he got the money, blow the building, the children, the adults, himself and his wife, everything. He was going to blow it all up and take us to this place that he referred to as the Brave New World. While the local police, sheriffs, and the FBI were outside, inside, the sense of panic was escalating. We had children sick to their stomach, crying, you know, and, and asking their teachers, why can't we go home? I want to go home. Young grew more agitated. He taped off an area in the middle of the room where only he and Doris could sit. If anyone else stepped inside his square, he said he would detonate the bomb. Strangely, with the youngs inside the square, the children felt safer. It was just like this total peace and this comforting feeling just touched everybody. It was just a feeling just to be relaxed and not to worry that you'll make it through it. I guess you could ex explain it as peace. Always, you know, that nothing could happen to us the peace was fleeting without warning the bomb went off the room was almost instantaneous black and we had teachers over there that were grabbing kids trying to get them out through the classroom windows this lady grabbed my hand and 
and she pushed me out the window. And I don't, I don't know if I would have made it out because I was too afraid to move. That was the most frightening experience. Not knowing how many I left, if any, and my classmates. Miraculously, the only two people who died that day were David and Doris Young. Everyone outside the so-called Magic Square survived. And I heard Mr. Moore and a whole bunch of people would start yelling, you know, we're all here, we all counted, we're all here. And that's when everybody in the town just started yelling, you know, that everybody was there. And it was, it was a great moment. Even though we were sad, kids were burned, kids were hurt. We were very happy we were all alive. And I could see my youngest daughter, Katie, sitting on the ground. I went to her and I embraced her. And she, at that point, stood and told me, Mommy, the angel saved us. In the chaos and everything that was happening, I think that maybe I didn't take her literally. Katie wasn't the only child who talked about angels in the classroom. As the town struggled to recover from their shared trauma, other children began quietly admitting that they'd been helped by angels too. I just kind of looked up and I saw this woman and she told me that to listen to my brother and everything would be okay. And I looked up again and she wasn't there anymore. And then my brother came over and he told me to stay by the window and everything would be okay. And he walked back across the room and that's when the bomb went off. A few weeks later, Katie saw the face of her angel again. She gazed out at Katie from her mother's locket. My mother had passed away when I was 15 and a half years old. And I had very few pictures of her. As soon as I opened the locket, she became so excited. And she looked at this woman in this locket and said, that's who she is. That's the woman that held me. She described this woman down to her hair where she was standing in the room. Everything about this woman, as if she had known her all her life. The woman in the locket was Katie's maternal grandmother, whom the child had never seen. She'd been dead for more than 13 years. When I saw the photo, they told me that she died, and I came to the realization that she had been sent to help me, and that she was my guardian angel. In the days that followed, trauma counselors heard from many children who had seen their own guardian angel, but not every parent believed what their children were telling them. I did not want my, my own son, flesh and blood, going around saying that he saw an angel. Ron Hartley had four children inside Cokeville Elementary when the bomb went off, but he was also the police detective in charge of the investigation. When his own son, Nathan, insisted that he had seen an angel, Hartley tried to be a cop first and a dad second. I just interviewed and interrogated my son. He said that uh, he was sitting there and all of a sudden these angels came down through the uh, ceiling and um, one of them came up to him and uh, just basic said, Nathan, I'm your great-grandmother, and what David and Doris are doing is wrong. And uh, that the bomb's going to go off. And I says, what was her name, Nathan? And he says, I think it was Grandma Meister. Well, I thought I had something there because I, that I could use to straighten him out because his grandmother Meister was still alive. So I resorted back to another cop technique, which is bring out the mug shots. We was thumbing through it and all of a sudden there's a picture of both his uh, grandmothers sitting there. And he just immediately put his little hand uh, on the page so I couldn't turn it. He says, that's her. He says, that's my guardian angel. He pointed to my grandma Elliot, uh, who was sitting right next to Grandma Meister. I says, Nathan, I says, why didn't you tell us this before? And uh, he just looked at me and he says, Dad, you wouldn't believe me. Whether or not there were angels in the room that day, some unseen force was at work. Investigators at the scene reported that the bomb was fully functional and should have been lethal. It should have been 160 people dead. 
Bomb technician Richard Haskell says the bomb should have been much more destructive. From where this window is down here to the, uh, to the north, everything on this side should have been gone. This wall should have been just literally laying down on the, on the grass. All the bricks and everything, it shouldn't even have been here. It should have been gone. In the aftermath, police videotaped the bombed out classroom. An image is clearly visible on the southeast wall. Another photo of the area captures what looks like the silhouette of an angelic figure. The children say, this is where one of the angels stood. That was a sign showing us, you know, that yes, this was a miracle, um, be grateful. I think there probably were, were angels in the room when the bomb went off. And so like the image was just impacted on the wall. There was an angel for everybody watching over him that day. There's absolutely no way that we could have made, made it through that without some kind of help. Angels are fast becoming the latest pop culture icon, but you won't find angel t-shirts and coffee mugs for sale in Cokeville. For the people of Cokeville, including children, parents, even the police, their angelic encounter has been a profound experience that's deeply personal and can never be trivialized. Next, are these bizarre deaths the result of alien experimentation or biotech warfare? I'm still scared as to what can happen in the future. The world's first documented case of livestock mutilation occurred more than 25 years ago, and the bizarre mutilations continue to this day. Theories about what could be causing these mutilations range from alien experimentation to covert military testing. Law enforcement agencies have investigated, but many ranch owners feel they still don't know who or what is killing their livestock. I lost 49 head of cattle to uh, the mutilations. I lost them in less than three weeks. At the, at the time of the mutilations, uh, and later on, we saw many lights up in the sky. We could not interpret where they were coming from. The eye was gone. The rectal area had a perfect round cut. The sex organs had been removed. The tongue was gone. No blood, no flies, nothing was around it. I believe this to be the greatest single unsolved serial crime spree of the 20th century. They come at night, mysterious craft piloted by an unseen crew. The morning light reveals yet another mutilated steer. It's happened hundreds of times over three decades. State investigators have come and gone. Natural predators, they insist. But cattle ranchers are not satisfied. They've seen things no known predator could do. Field researcher Chris O'Brien has gained their trust. This animal is obviously a roadkill, but any report of a downed animal in the area I'd like to check out because of the ongoing problem that we have with the mutilations. In September of 1967, the first documented animal mutilation occurred in this field and drew worldwide attention. Researchers came from far and wide to investigate. 30 years later, interest has waned, but local ranchers are still forced to cope with dead animals. The uh, night before, I saw the cow alive, and she had a calf with her, and they looked healthy to me, and by next morning, early in the morning, she was uh, mutilated. Eli Hornick has been running cattle in northern New Mexico for more than 14 years. His cattle have been the most recent victims of the mutilation mystery. Last two years, we've lost 10 head of cattle, and uh, nine yearlings and one cow. And you know, you're, you're talking about quite a bit of money. Something that's pretty interesting, if, you, if, if a human doesn't mess with it or something doesn't disturb it, the, the birds, coyotes, they'll just leave it alone. Hornick's cattle showed the classic signs of mutilation, precise incisions, a conspicuous lack of blood, and no physical evidence of a predator, man or animal, at the crime scene. There's never any tracks, never any blood, it's, it's a real clean deal. Normally, when you arrive at, a, at an animal mutilation uh, site, you'll find, basically, that there's no evidence whatsoever. There's no blood at all, there's no tracks, no uh, cigarette butts. All the evidence indicates that the animals are being dropped from the air. So it seems to most researchers that the animals are being taken somewhere else, being experimented on, and then being dropped back where they were found. Livestock inspector Jerry Valerio has investigated the mutilations and they fit the pattern he's seen in dozens of other cases. The incisions are done real precise. Every incision that we've 
dealt with has been almost identical to every uh, uh, animal that has been mutilated. Most of these cattle mutilations features perfectly circular cuts that have indication of high heat that has been used to, to make the cuts. Despite the consistent pattern of bloodless surgical incisions, state and federal authorities insist predators like coyotes and foxes are responsible. For them, case closed. I've seen a lot of uh, uh, animals that have been torn up by, uh, by coyotes and other predators, birds mostly, right. and their sensations were just like a doctor would do in a hospital. When you see an animal of this nature that's been mutilated, it's clean, no blood, it's not done by predators. Dr. John Altshuler is a pathologist who studied tissue samples from hundreds of cattle mutilations over the past five years. A predator, even in, with the accuracy of gnawing and biting, would have jagged borders. The fact that the tissue at the incisional areas is very firm and very hard and looks burned. And the microscopic evidence clearly indicates that heat has been applied. And predators, to my knowledge, cannot do that. What could create these burnt-edged incisions is a highly sophisticated portable laser. Lasers have the, the ability to actually cauterize the wound, stop the bleeding as you're cutting. But no portable laser is powerful enough to cut and cauterize masses of livestock tissue. At Kirtland Air Force Base, Colonel Michael Prairie demonstrates the world's most precise portable laser. Going through a quarter of an inch of flesh, you'd have to take several passes, maybe five or ten passes to get through. The precision of the cut is uh, limited to the precision of the operator. If you needed to make a circular cut with very tight tolerances, you'd have to find some other way, uh, some kind of mechanical system to, to make such a cut. If our government doesn't have laser technology capable of these mutilations, who or what does? The causes uh, behind these mutilations is absolutely unknown. I believe that there's multiple groups involved in this for various reasons. The tissue that is being excised from these animals is the fastest regenerating tissue um, in, in the bodies and have residual uh, elements of their environment in them. Anonymous groups with advanced technology mutilating livestock? Sounds impossible, but consider this new theory. Biotech companies are fighting a super secret war to be the first to find an artificial substitute for human blood. A lot of them are using the hemoglobin in cattle blood as their base. The first company to develop this artificial blood could have a $10 billion market all to themselves. The stakes are high, and they don't want the competition to know what they're doing. Whenever these mutilations occur, there was always a sighting of helicopters around the area. In a lot of cases, strange lights have been seen around mutilation sites, and most often, helicopters are seen in and around mutilation sites. It's like someone is monitoring these areas where these animal deaths are occurring. People ask me, why are they leaving these carcasses lying around these pastures? I think these carcasses are taken and then returned is somehow to instill fear in the rancher. I am over my anger, but uh, I'm still very confused, and I'm still scared as, as to what can happen in the future. There's somebody somewhere that knows what's doing this. You know, we need to get it out in the open and, and get, try to get stopped. Until we get people to report these cases and get the help of state and federal law enforcement officials, we're spinning our wheels. There are no answers. There are just thousands of questions and thousands of dead animals. Since our report, rancher Eli Hornick has discovered yet another mutilated steer on his property. Like the livestock in our report, this animal appears to have died from laser-precise incisions and an enormous loss of blood. Next, a rare discovery leads experts to believe that monsters exist. There may be far more species uh, on the planet than we thought previously. The search for ancient creatures. Until recently, most biologists thought science had discovered all the big, obvious animals with warm blood and fur. They contend, therefore, that Bigfoot and Yeti must be simply mythological creatures. But last spring, biologists on a field trip along the Vietnam-Laos border proved their colleagues wrong. They found not one, but three new species of mammal. Just a year old, she's a legend come to life. 
The creature locals have described as an antelope with gills now has a scientific name, the Vu Kuang ox. In the same region, biologists found the remains of two additional new species. The giant munjak is a saber-toothed deer, and the slow-running deer is a creature who should have been as easy to catch up with as the name implies. This is in North Vietnam in the mountainous, very mountainous region. Very few people have been in the region to begin with. It's an extremely rich area. And um, one of the things that intrigued me was the suggestion that all these new creatures are very ancient. The mammals found in Southeast Asia are not the only ancient creatures to resurface after their supposed extinction. Uh, the coelacanth is a, um, a sort of fish that uh, was discovered off the coast of South Africa. And that is a fish that belongs to a group of fish which was thought to have become extinct about 80 million years ago. It is now thought by some people that there may be as many as 30 million species of organisms on the planet or more. The point is, is that we have reason to believe now that there may be far more species uh, on the planet than we thought previously. Cryptozoologists like Roy Mackel believe the clues to discovering some of these 30 million undiscovered species can be found in legends and persistent folk tales. Back in the 60s, when we first took seriously that perhaps behind such things as Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, the Sasquatch, there might be real animals, we were just laughed at. I am a zoologist. I study creatures which are known to exist, and I also discover new unknown creatures. But every time we go out and we discover something new, the cryptozoologists treat this somehow as being a victory for their side. But the new kinds of animals that turn up are turned up by people like me. But cryptozoologists feel there's a kind of conceit in a mainstream scientific community that won't acknowledge the thousands of fantastic sightings reported by laymen every year. Is it possible that among the millions of undiscovered species, we may find dinosaurs and the humanoid primate legend his name Sasquatch and Yeti? There have been mainstream zoologists who have said that no more, no more large quadrupeds, that is four-legged animals, are, are going to be discovered. And they've been proved wrong over and over again. That's the great thing about Vu Quang. He is, you know, again, an area in one of the most densely populated nations on Earth, in a small area, and yet these things are unknown to science until just recently. So there is a fair amount of territory left on Earth where scientists really haven't exhaustively explored the area. And I do expect a lot will be found. The newly discovered mammals have been part of Vietnamese and Laotian mythology for centuries. It wasn't until they were captured and identified by biologists, however, that they officially existed. Some cryptozoologists contend the same will be true for centuries of reported Bigfoot and Yeti sightings. They believe it's only a matter of time until these creatures are found to exist officially. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the Sightings Hotline at 1-900-933-SIGHT. That's 1-900-933-7444. Each call 65 cents a minute. Average call lasts three minutes. Sightings is also online. Our email address is sightings at aol.com. On the next edition of Sightings, the military has a new secret weapon. Was this technology recovered from an alien spacecraft? I can't say for sure what we saw was of this Earth. Then, this woman knows what your pet is thinking. You can sing, you can talk, this mommy's peaches. And a psychic detective's vision of murder. I just need to touch something that was on the victim. I, I touch it and I can become them. That's next time. Until then, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White.